standing barrier. We're thinking new about Kent, what this country could become if it thought new. He is a standard bearer for intellectual discovery in the area of economics. He comes from a time, having uh, just retired, or recently retired from the University of Massachusetts, where he taught economics for many years. He comes from a time, from a time when to think of some alternative to capitalism, or some options within the envelope of capitalism, was early on was considered traitorous. For a person to be talking about uh, the, the flaws in capitalism, or the flaws in the system we currently have, and the defects in the people it leaves out, for a person to be talking about the in, inevitable cyclicality of the economic system we have now, which, which builds up these big, uh, these big uh, uh, pyramids and then collapses over and over again throughout history, to be talking about that was in the 1950s when uh, Richard first began teaching uh, uh, likely to get you subjected to censure in the university, certainly uh, uh, being blocked on public radio, public uh, and television. It, it, it required a character of um, incredible self-knowledge to be able to stand up and say not what was expected within the economic community to say, but to stand up and say what seemed right to him, what seemed correct and, uh, as, a, as, a, as a systematic and logical analysis to him, in spite of the opprobrium that would come his way if he descended from the majority ideology. And the majority ideology of the free market is not just a, an economic theory. It has become, it has taken the place of religion. So we now have a religion of money, religion of the free market, which cannot be contested. And the Supreme Court of the United States has embodied that religion in the First Amendment <coughs> to say that if you are uh, going to uh, uh, enact laws that limit the right of corporations to speech, or the right of corporations to participate in elections, you are inhibiting their uh, First Amendment rights because in a free market, in a free society with a free market, everybody can speak. With the billions that you happen to have it in a receipt under the bridges where you can speak to, you can do, do your best. But it is the, the Constitution of the United States now says that if you've got the billions, you can talk. And if you don't have the billions, you can't talk. Or you can, but you can only talk to the amount that you have in your pocket. And against that uh, embodiment of now of a market theory into the Constitution comes Richard Wolf. In the last five years, he has been burst onto the scene nationally to take his place as one of those people who said, wait a minute, with a sense of humor, wait a minute, with a good uh, demeanor, wait a minute, without calling people frauds and cheats and all the other names that we could think about that might apply directly and applicably to Wall Street. He's not doing that. He's talking with a, with, he's not talking softly and carrying a big stick, he's talking loudly and carrying a sense of humor. And that's pretty terrific. So we have with us tonight a man who has now been touring the country, being invited to go to various places in the country to talk about uh, asking us, asking us to leave beside the constructs of economics and the constructs of, of uh, American political theory with which we have all been trained, to leave beside the ideas that have, uh, that have nourished us and of which we have taken pride, in which we have taken pride over the last uh, 70 years. He is suggesting to us that it is time to think like human beings, to think on our own, to think with a sense of responsibility, to think with our own creativity. And so uh, we are honored here tonight to have Richard Wolf, Wolf come and give us uh, a chance to think big and new. Richard Wolf, welcome.
tribute that a kind man with a big heart uh, offered me, for which I am grateful, as I am for the invitation uh, to come here tonight. I have to begin, as I often do, by asking you please to remember that if some of the things I tell you about the banking system and what banks are and do is troubling and unpleasant, that I am merely the messenger. <laughs> and remember, you do not hurt the messenger because you don't like the message. I wish I had the power to be responsible for any of the things I'm about to tell you about. I don't. But the first way we can, first step we can take to dealing with them is to know what they are. And so I'm going to start with a, an expression of the deep and abiding respect I have for the monster banks that control the American financial system. The Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Morgan Stanley, you know them. They may populate your dreams, but they certainly shape your economic reality in ways that I will talk about. It's not been a good time for them. Not so much in the realm of profits. They have recovered. The recovery you read about, you know, the one that you keep wondering seems to have missed your house, <laughs> did not miss them. They have recovered. They're doing fine. Which, considering that they brought us the crisis, is no mean achievement. Had a crisis, they were a key player in bringing it, and they are the first and foremost to have recovered. So that's not the hard time they're having. The hard time they're having comes because their exposure in this crisis has led all kinds of reporters, government agencies, to ask those embarrassing questions that should have been asked long ago. But weren't. But now, for a little while, the windows are open, and so I'm going to list to you some of the achievements of our large banks, because I want that open window to make it really clear to all of us just what they've been doing that isn't so safe. So here's the beginning. Every single thing I'm about to mention they have been caught at, they have been prosecuted for, they have been found to act illegally and or unethically on a scale that is nothing short of stupendous. So go with me on a short travelogue through their deeds. Number one. They have admitted, in many cases, the banks admitted and paid fines in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and for some of the things I'm going to tell you, fines in the quite a few billions of dollars. That's what they've been caught at. That was the deal of fines and punishments they paid. That's not the extent of their misbehavior. First is money laundering. I want to be sure you all understand that the biggest banks in the United States, and also in other countries, I don't want to suggest it's only U.S. banks, but the biggest banks in the country have been busy over recent years laundering money. What does that mean? It means knowingly taking money that comes from criminal en enterprises around the world, accepting that money into your own banking system, holding it for a while, then passing it out so it loses the bad odor of where it came from and looks instead like money from a very reputable bank. This has been a very useful function that banks have played for criminals for a long time, and I want you to know that our biggest banks have been masters at it and deserve the praise and the adulation that goes with being a master at anything. Number two. Something a little bit unusual that may not have caught your mind. It's called the LIBOR scandal. L-I-B-O-R. 
London Interbank Offer Rate. An obscure business. It turns out that the world's interest rate, let me say that again, the world's interest rates are set by a very clubby and chummy operation in London, in which a bunch of banks tell an official in London what their borrowing rates are, what they're charging certain borrowers, and they all tell that on a regular basis to a, a fellow there in London, and he kind of works out an average which he announces and then interest rates around the world are set in relationship to what these banks have announced. Is there a check to make sure that what they announce is actually what they're charging? No. Is there a check on the fellow who takes all the information and kind of works out what it works out averages do? No. But what you pay for your payments on your car, or your home, or your credit card, are shaped by that interest rate procedure, that chummy, clubby arrangement in London. And the banks got caught purposely and intentionally misleading these folks in London, because by telling them that the interest rate was a little larger than what they were actually charging, or a little smaller, they could make big trades that were more advantageous than the average person could. Or, that would, if the interest rates were lower, would make the value of their bond holdings seem larger than they actually were. This is immoral, illegal, unethical fraud. And they were caught, lots of them, and have been fined millions of dollars for that illegally setting the interest rates that millions, billions of people around the world have to pay, including everyone in this room. These are not bank scandals that don't touch you. They touch you right in your pocketbook, in your wallet. Third, banks have, the biggest banks in the United States have admitted to charging an immense raft of illegal fees. You've all experienced that the $35 you have to pay if you do an overdraft on your checking account, the $15 you have to pay if a check given to you by an unknown person bounces rather than clearing, and a thousand other fees, gouging. And who do they gouge the most from? Those who have the biggest problem with overdrafts, the poor, the elderly who don't pay close attention to their monthly statements and don't catch these things. Wow. Stealing from the poor and the elderly. Another great achievement of our biggest banks. People to look up to. People really doing something for the community. Giving something back. Next. The mortgage fiasco. I don't have enough time to give that to you. And on the other hand, I don't feel bad about it because from years you've been reading about it periodically in the newspaper. Here they did really creative things. I want to give due respect to our biggest bankers. Besides fleecing us all, they have used creativity that needs to be recognized. They took all the mortgages and all the car loans and all the student loans and all the credit card loans and they bundled them, that's their word, they bundled them into a new kind of security. You know, in the old days you bought a share of stock, you bought a piece of a company that was doing something. But the genius of modern banking created the possibility of a new kind of security. You're not buying a share of a company doing anything. You're buying a piece of a whole bunch of people's debts. So that when those people pay off their debts, you get a piece of the payoff they're making. So for those of you, for example, that are still paying your mortgages, you should be aware that that monthly payment you make is actually taken by your bank and parceled out to all the people who have a piece of your debt. These are called asset-backed securities. Not a name we need to remember, but it's this new kind of security. The banks 
brought that to us. And then, and smart people, and then they said, you know, we can sell these things. We can go around the world and tell people, this is a better investment than buying a share of a company that makes something. We can get you a better rate of return. Buy a piece of other people's debts. After all, they're buying pieces of yours. So you should get in on it. And so they ran around. And the reason? They got fantastic fees. When they took those mortgages and bundled them together, they gave a little something to themselves for that hard work. And when they went around and sold it to you, they gave themselves a little commission for all that hard work. They began to realize they didn't want to be in the position that they used to have been in of giving you a loan for your home, for your car, for your, and then you know holding on to it as you pay it back. They didn't want to do it because their economists told them that Americans in the years ahead are not going to be able to pay it back. So it's not smart to hold that stuff. The bank said, Eureka, smart. We'll take these loans that we give the local folk, which we know they can't pay back, and we'll palm it off on investors and say to them, buy a share of these debts. You get stuck with the debt that can't be paid back. And the investors, some of them were smart enough to know that when you're dealing with a big banker in a beautiful suit, in an office with mahogany furniture and deep leather chairs, hold on to your wallet. <laughs> so they said to these bankers, uh, uh, we're not, uh, how do we know? I'm sort of, uh, hmm, how do we know that this uh, hundred mortgages that these people can pay? How do we know that those students will ever pay? No, students, after all. We're not going to. Well, the banks were smart. They went to something called the rating agencies. Three of them control the market. We're a country that deeply believes in competition. That's why we only have three companies to take care of this enormous business. Standard and Four, Poor, Moody's and Fitch by name, and you want to look them up. And so the banks went to them and said, would you please give them a very high rating? And the, the rating company said, with that professionalism that we admire so in the ranks of high finance, what exactly would you like? Triple A would be nice, good. And in 12 seconds, they got it. 12 seconds is called due diligence. <laughs> it's when you look closely at something to evaluate how risky it is. And so they all got these ratings. The courts are full of cases now that will take years to resolve of all the people who invested in these crazy securities because they had a AAA rating and lost everything. But there were still some skeptical investors who didn't trust the banks and they didn't trust the rating. But here comes the best part. So the bankers said, you know what would get the suckers, excuse me, the investors? What will get the investors is if we attach to the asset-backed security, this piece of other people's debts, an insurance policy which says if the homeowner or the car loan owner or the student doesn't pay back, you, the investor, don't have to worry because an insurance company will make good on what the debtor defaults on. And they got that. Those, of course, are insurance policies, and they should have been called an insurance policy, but they weren't. They were called a name that nobody in their right mind would have used. A credit default swap, a CDS. Why were they called such an arcane name if they were an insurance policy? The answer is that the insurance racket, excuse me, industry, the insurance industry has been as praiseworthy and as responsible as the bankers have throughout our history, which is why every one of the 50 states has an insurance commission to watch what these scoundrels do. 
And if you call the insurance policy that you stapled to every asset-backed security an insurance policy, if you called it that, because that's what it was, you'd have to go in front of the insurance commission and kind of tell, did you have the money to, to, to pay it off? In which the insurance companies, being very responsible members of the community, leaders of the community, didn't want to do for some reason I can't figure out. <laughs> so they called them a credit default swap. Now investors around the world got together and they began to buy these things because what could you lose? The interest rate was good, they were AAA rated, and they had an insurance policy. What could go wrong? <laughs> In 2007 and 8, millions of Americans began to do what any moron who looked at the situation of this country would have said they would do coming. Ever since the 1970s, wages in the United States, real wages, what you could afford to buy, have been flat. If you adjust the wage for what you can actually buy for it, the wages of American, the average wage in America today is about what it was in 1978. Meanwhile, Americans, who couldn't buy any more with their wages, went crazy with really the only way to keep enjoying the American dream if your wages don't go up to pay for it. They went on a borrowing binge the likes of the world had never seen. But you know, if you keep borrowing and the wages with which you pay it back are flat, the day is going to come when your debts are bigger than what you can pay. And that came in 2007, and Americans by the millions announced to their creditors, uh, we're never going to pay you back. No way is that going to happen for the simple reason that we not only don't have the money, we have even zero prospect of acquiring it. Wow. Suddenly people, the investors, those savvy folks around the world who have bought these asset-backed securities with the AAA rating and the insurance policy stapled to it, said, ha, oh, we don't care. We're going to the insurer and saying, see those Americans, they're not paying, so make good. And the biggest company standing behind those insurance policies was something called the American International Group. Doesn't that sound solid? <laughs> Paragon of the financial community, a leader in high finance. It was the biggest insurance company on the planet, AIG. And so as hundreds of thousands of investors converged on the offices of AIG in New York, 